Well, we've sung our sermon today. If you have a knee, come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs> oh, do I wish. Looking forward to the blessing that God intends from the sharing of this lesson today. As you're getting comfortable for the next few minutes, it's an honor and a privilege I never take for granted to be here and to share a message that blesses my life as I help have an influence in your walk with Christ. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the Assembled Worship at Oak Hill Church of Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight that I have to stand up here, privileged to see so many from so many different backgrounds and, and together worshiping God. That's a work of God. Only He can do that. And it's great to see. So I do pray that you pray for me and the delivery of the message that's been uh, prepared for and already has been prayed for. Thank you so much for that. We believe that the Bible is God's Word. We believe that Jesus is the risen Lord in whom all spiritual blessings are found, namely salvation. So we love Him, and it's our love for Him and our love for everyone that compels us to embrace His great commission based in Matthew 28, which is summarized this way on the screen for all of us to say together. Would you say it with me? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. Take that gospel to the world. They need to know it. This week's Bible devotional focuses on the role of shepherds in his family, and they have a tremendous role to protect, preserve, and mature brethren in New Testament doctrine to properly discern and divide the Word. They have a tremendous responsibility in this. And as such, Christ's church is distinguished by his doctrines. That's how you can tell if it's his church. Do they believe what he says? Do they follow his way? So be blessed by the 91 lessons that we are having in our Sunday, Wednesday night classes on Bible doctrine, specifically on what does the New Testament scriptures say. We've had 33 of those lessons already, and some matters the elders want spotlighted as they come along. And because of the month of May, we just swapped two lessons to have it early and not late in, Ju uh, late in June. Uh, you have a little bit of a break from me uh, in the month of May, uh, except for Mother's Day. After this lesson, you may want a break from me, so I understand that. I understand that. But today is another time for a spotlighted theme. If this sermon prompts any question or beckons any further discussion, I first ask you to review last Wednesday night's class. Because it was a self-contained lesson by Leroy Brownlow, great content, well-worded, and worth its time. For more detailed study, if you want to introduce yourself and familiarize yourself with this issue, if you haven't only but heard what people have said, it's hard to narrow down a good source. But Dave Miller wrote this great, concise book, very thorough and concise, on this matter in refute to some event that took place and what does the Bible say in response to what was said that day. So it's a very worthy book written for the apologeticspress.org website. Great book. I recommend it to read and to grow from. On the other hand, if you, after this study, are curious for more detailed personal application, I recommend this podcast. Now, the lesson today will address the assembled worship in the public setting. This particular episode of the podcast Today with Jesus by thelightnetwork.tv does an excellent job discussing how far we take this in our personal walk or expression of joy to the Lord. You, as a Christian perhaps, might want that lesson after this. They did a good job. I won't repeat what they said. That's, that's their lesson, not this one. But I recommend those two or three sources. Episode, uh, season 4, Episode 8. Today's lesson is rooted in a few key principles, and that's what I want to focus on. The authority of Scripture and the hermeneutic approach we bring to the Word of God. Sometimes I hear people say things over any issue or matter, and I think, just how much do they revere the Word? And how much do they reverence God who spoke it? That's a good question. That's the approach we're going to take. Now, we could deal with, as we interpret and apply Scripture, direct commands, necessary inference, apostolic example, and the such like. In fact, in the manner of, 
The first century church, the very word acapella has come to have certain understandings, but it simply means at the root in the manner of, because that's what they did. Every New Testament act that we do for worship today, praying and singing and communion and giving and studying the word, hearing it professed as we meditate on it, all of the things that we are doing are do, being done in the manner of the first century church. Every Sunday, I hold up the Bible. And I remind us that this is the standard in all religious matters. Sometimes I assume, sometimes I wonder if people know what that means. And I know that inherent within my role of preaching is to teach because faith comes by hearing and teaching is required to get people where they belong. I always want to be a springboard for the faithful to help encourage and strengthen. That's my forte. Everyone knows that's what I do. And yet there are times to address things like this. Some people are open for teaching. Some people are not. So I pray that it's well received. Regarding today's matter on instrumental music or the use of the instrument in assembled worship, it's, <laughs> it's only worth our time because it addresses or it springs up as a consequence of something more important, I believe, and that's reverence for Christ and His authority and how we approach Scripture and His covenant as a foundation of maturity to grow from. A humble heart, please listen to every word carefully, a humble heart first answers this question. Do we want to give God what He wants? Or do we prefer ourselves? God's will or our way? Now this is a question of the heart. And God knows our heart. Let's make sure that we do. Will He be more gracious to some on that day than we might think? Most likely. Will he be more stern towards some on that day than they think? Most likely. I remind you that it is not our place to tell God how to accept us. It is our place to accept what God says we are to do to be acceptable to him. As we consider the flow of Scripture... Moving from the former covenant to the new. The one question I want to ask and answer before we even begin the lesson, and I know we already technically have begun, but that's what a preacher does. Before we begin, before we begin, we'll finally get to it. But pertaining to the authority of the New Testament Scripture, which is the blueprint for us, the New Testament church, let's ask this question. Why? Why would we even want or need to let the New Testament be our covenant to live under and to follow no matter what it asks of us? Why? The answer is in the prologue of the Gospels. It's all about Jesus. That's why. And it's well summarized in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. If you're there with me, please follow along. For when we... We're still without strength. In due time, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The subject is us. He died for us, the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, one will, dare, uh, one will die. Yet, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that, which means here's how he did it. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We see that grace initially given, and it sustains. But fo follow this. Outside of Christ, we are all lost sinners outside of Christ. We were in rebellion to God's will. We were in rejection to the superior holy king's will and purpose for our lives. And so, instead of justly destroying us, God himself did not choose to wipe us out, but through Jesus Christ himself in flesh died to pay our sin debt. And that made atonement, and that made forgiveness and reconciliation and redemption all possible. 
He not only offered the sacrifice, he was and became the sacrifice. That is why we listen to what he has to say. That sacrificial love deserves our love and reverent devotion. How much do we love the Lord? How strong is our loyalty as a foundation for maturity? Well, both are tested whenever he, his prescribed will seems to counter, listen carefully, a personal preference. Do we uphold reverently God's will or do we insist, and that's the heart word, insist on personal preference? That's the question the heart has to answer. And that's what I'm directing our minds on today. For some reason, and for some people, <laughs> among many things, the heart is tested by today's question. What about instrumental worship? We're asking the question academically, is there authority for its use or their use in the assembled worship? Uh, it's a grammatical uh, phrase, but I'll reword it on the screen are they permitted if there is no prohibition? So just what does the Bible say? It may surprise some that many have found instrumental worship and have decided it's okay. Now, hold that thought. I've got a few more minutes, so hold that thought. We're simply going to ask, where do they find it? Well, some people find it in the Old Testament. Some people find instrumental worship in the Old Testament, for sure. Under the former covenant, David himself used an instrument to express joy and praise to the Lord. And this example is seen in Psalm 150. It's even stated as a command in 2 Chronicles 29. David, a man who was chosen by the Lord, and after his heart in that sense as well, he grew to always seek God's will and, and repent when sin was pointed out. Yes, that's how we should all be described. But does the practice then, in the former covenant, allow us to practice it now, to be grafted into the current covenant? I see signs so often, the Ten Commandments are not suggestions. I get it. As important as the Ten Commandments were, I only followed nine of those ten because they were grafted into the new covenant. Hebrews 7, 12 explains that when the priesthood changed from Aaron to Christ, the law also changed. Galatians 3 explains that we are not under the old law. We can learn from it, but we're not under it. Everything was to point to Christ. So God certainly accepted David's praise. He wasn't under the new law for sure. But those former covenants, uh, Galatians 3, 10 through 14, describes why it's very frightening to let the former covenant influence anything of worship practice under the new covenant namely because of salvation. I know the context of Galatians 5. If we want to submit to the old law, we are submitting to a curse because it revealed the sting of, of the law, death. A sting of sin is death and the law. So circumcision is referenced as something you've got to do. And I'm thinking, no, that's met by Christ, the circumcision of the heart. If we depend on the law to govern us in principle, Christ becomes of no effect. And I just am so careful, reverently cautious to not depend on the old law when I need his grace every day. I must acknowledge this fact. I'm not under the covenant. I'm not under that old law. And I think that just needs to be pointed out when we go to it for attempted justification. So many people find it. Many people find instrumental worship in the symbolism of heaven, the symbolism of heaven, the symbolic pictures of heaven. And yes, in the new covenant, we have that marvelous completion to the revelation of God in the book we call The Revelation of Jesus Christ. 
directing our eyes toward the hope of Jesus' return and the promise of his reward to the faithful saints of being with him, dwelling in heaven forever. I want to go to heaven because God is there. That's what will make it heaven to us. The rationale is this, though. If God allowed worship of instruments uh, with instruments in the old law, and then if he's going to allow them in heaven, note the wording carefully, if he's going to allow them in heaven, how could anyone claim that uh, they're not allowed in the church today? Uh, I often remind people in political season, listen very carefully to words and substance. Don't be fooled by words over substance for sure, but listen to the wording. The question is wrong because it assumes some things that are not quite right. Uh, I get the reasoning, though. I get the reasoning. Uh, if it's based in the revelation, though, we have to ask, does the portrayal, does the symbolic portrayal of heaven give us the contextual allowance to let the images in the book provide equipping for instrumental worship on earth by the saints under the new covenant? That's a fair question. And this directs our minds to acknowledge the fact it is by nature a symbolic book. Not even heaven is going to be a physical place. Not sure how that's going to work, but God does. He figured that out. But this directs our minds to accept how to interpret a symbolic book, apocalyptically written, of course. If chapter 5 is to be taken literal, then remember this. It's the same eldership that's holding the harps in chapter 4. And they are dressed in white, wearing golden crowns, and casting their golden crowns before the throne, and offering and holding bowls of golden uh, bowls of incense. Golden bowls of incense. Okay. Is it okay to literally apply figurative imagery into New Testament worship? Is that a proper hermeneutic application of the text? If so, how far do we go? Listen carefully to the wording. Are we also desiring to enter the building wearing white garments and literally wearing golden crowns that we cast before some elaborate chair and then offering some, some incense? If people wanted to, the same rationale to justify preference would be employed in this as well. But let's be honest, the nature of the book is symbolic. So we can't take the symbols as authority for what we are specifically told to do. But rather, we must consider what these symbols represent. What does this imagery around the throne represent? Uh, purity and humility before God. What do the bowls of incense represent? We're told the prayers of the saints. So don't offer incense. Do what the scriptures specifically tell us in the inspired epistles. Pray. We also should consider this. The context of Revelation 15 beautifully uh, uh, highlights the, the completion of God's will uh, God is a great script writer. He's the masterful script writer. And he references Old Testament imagery of all things. We just talked about the Old Testament. He references Old Testament imagery to these first century Christians, not because that was how they were supposed to worship, but because the readers would be familiar with where the covenant started. And it would remind them of how it comes full circle. Everything points to Christ. So God has the right, God has the wisdom to refer to things in the former covenant to use in a symbolic way that they could understand and appreciate that helps people see everything leads to Christ. It's all been leading to Him for the salvation of all. But can we use these images for the authority for worship as such, as such? And under the new covenant, we've already discussed some uh, uh, dangers of going to any other covenant for that. So many find instrumental worship in the New Testament silence. And that's interesting. <laughs> They'll try to put the burden of proof on the one who's contesting their use. So those who strongly prefer their use will attempt to challenge the contestant and ask, when did God take away the instrument of worship? Or when did God condemn the use of instruments in worship? It's ironic that they will try to argue from silence because they believe that's a safe platform, but I wouldn't take this approach. Uh, it's ironic because they'll say, it may not say to, but it also may not say not to. 
that's not only scary. For some people's hearts, that could be very insulting to suggest that God cannot communicate what he wants. At this point, it's the influence of my college days that make me want to go into some of those uh, hermeneutic uh, approaches of generic, specific command, expediency, and, and uh, law of exclusion, and all that stuff. But here's the question. When does silence permit, and when does silence forbid? We have to deal with that every day. We do things that we can't find in Scripture. For example, the Great Commission that we just referenced at the beginning of the sermon time. It says to go, it says to baptize, and it says to teach. We know what to teach, the gospel. You can't change that. But we have no specific command telling us how to go, and I'm thankful. If you applied legalistically the apostolic example of that, you'd say, oh, no, we can't use cars. They only used horses and camels and boats back then. But that's all we got to do. Uh, that's, there's nothing wrong with, with uploading a video to the Internet. That's a way to do it. But as I think about this, the Scriptures say nothing about note sheets that you have, handouts, projection screens, Scriptures Say teach, and that is a method to enhance the teaching. Yes, yes. That's actually one of the purposes for singing, actually, is to teach and admonish and encourage one another. Colossians 3, 16 tells us this. So we're encouraged, we're taught, we're, we're, we're exhorted by the reminding of truths. Listen carefully. Spoken words do much better at that than mere notes from an instrument. But the question is still not, not going in the right direction. What's the question? Does the New Testament silence forbid their use? And if so, how? Here would be the simple answer. Within the New Covenant, God has specified exactly what He wants and how He wants it. Like the Lord's Supper, referenced by Ron earlier, we have the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread specified as what we do for the communion, this act of assembled worship. When I'm at home and any meal I eat, I'm thankful to the Lord for it. I'm even praising Him in my heart for it. But when it comes to assembled worship, I do what He says I should do. I do what He wants. And that's a good principle to, to, uh, to live by. For any of his instructions of a simple praise, we will either reverently adhere or we will alter, regardless of preference. And I think that's good for consideration of the body as well, but that's another point. It's at this point that I address those who seem to be bent on the instrument's use, believing that they are permitted by New Testament silence. I'm only going to ask this. Do we understand the significance of, and the meaning of only being under the new covenant. Hebrews 7, 12 tells me I'm under the law of Christ, which if I live by it, it will give me life. If I don't live by it, it will bring judgment. I'm just reverently, personally cautious to live by what God has told me. And upon that awareness, that use, I'm then challenged by how I live by it. And this is where it gets into God's judgment call. I'm not going to sit on God's judgment seat like an arrogant Pharisee, I'm not going to do that. But I know the law that he has given. So in this matter, I'm not looking at the New Testament for where God took them away. I'd have to look for where God brought them into it. And, and he did not. I, I'm not in God's judgment seat, but I know I will be judged based on the word he's given and how I live by it. So additionally, I want you to remember 2 Timothy chapter 3. It points out that Scripture will teach us and admonish us and reprove us, correct us and train us in all righteousness. It, everything we need to be pleasing to God is in the Scriptures. But that is not true if God overlooked some detail, and left something important out, some good work out in a symbol of worship. So, as I think of the implications of thinking a sovereign God left something out, and I want to put it back in, I, I'm cautious towards the heart that would do that without the reverence that is pleasing to Him. So, simply put, the New Testament does not equip us for the instrument in worship because He says nothing about it. That's why we just don't do it. 
And I don't think that's an accident. God knows what he's doing. And on that note, I heard an interesting thought even yesterday. What if God had included that in any fashion, in any grammar? Uh, people might begin to assume that we need an instrument to worship God. And maybe that's why God kept it so simple, among many other points of wisdom. I simply can't use silence to authorize when the specific command to sing says that's what he wants. As a side note to us, I'm going to speak to us at Oak Hill. Uh, let's not think that we are pleasing to God for not doing what he has not told us to do when we aren't doing what he has told us to do. If you are physically able, please stop making excuses not to sing. Back to the sermon. That was a bonus. Many find instrumental worship in post-biblical history. They look at ancient writings of ancient Christians, first century Christians, Nicene Fathers. This has been a fun journey for me. I've enjoyed going back into some of these. Uh, post-biblical history. I want to be thorough, but for time's sake, I know I have to be concise. I'll speak quickly, but listen, listen quickly and carefully. Here's an interesting quote by none other than Clement of Alexandria. He lived so close to the apostles that you would suspect he would know their practices of worship. Okay. This is a statement that first seems to suggest that instrumental worship was just part of their life. And it goes as this. Uh, it's not on the screen, but I will read it for you uh, in my notes. For the apostle adds teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to God. And even if, as he writes, if you wish to sing and play to the harp or lyre, there is no blame. Thou shalt imitate the righteous Hebrew king in his thanksgiving to God. Rejoice in the Lord, yea, rejoice. Praise is comely to the upright, says the prophecy. Confess to the Lord on the harp and play to him who on the psaltery of the ten strings, sing to him a new song, and does not the ten string psaltery indicate the word Jesus, who is manifested by the element of the decade? Uh, I don't have to tell you what that sounds like. <laughs> they had thoughts back then that, that the same words don't always convey. You have to dig deep. I don't have to tell you that this sounds like the post-biblical Christian, the first century Christians or second century Christians, worshipped with the instrument. But if you dig, dug a little deeper, you'll find that there's an opposite picture. I'm going to give you a quote by the same guy. And it goes like this. And he who is of David, and yet before him, the word of God, he's speaking of Christ, despising the lyre and harp, which is but lifeless instruments, and having turned by the Holy Spirit the universe and a tune, fine tuned the universe, and especially man, that's a clue, who composed of body and soul is a universe in miniature, makes melody to God on this instrument of the many tones, and to this instrument, I mean man, he sings accordant. That's beautiful. I wish people talked this way today. I, I miss this stuff. I, I thrive on this type of, 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 of nourishment for the soul. Clement doesn't sound confused here, so how do we mesh these two statements? He did not use instruments in worship, believing that the great instrument of music was the individual Christian singing unaided. So that's just interesting to, to discern this. I find it intriguing that he personally believes that reference to instruments in the Psalms was actually symbolic. I, I would disagree with that, but I respect that, and I admire then the approach he takes to see that human being is the instrument of God, and I take more biblical approach on that idea. So I'll appreciate his, his direction and thought. But here's the greater point. As fun as that journey was, here's the greater point. 2 Timothy 3 says, God equipped us for every good work, and so it doesn't matter what anyone did after the New Testament was completed. I don't care in that sense what anyone did after the time of the completed inspired Scripture. Because 
we cannot use an example of any person. The amount of people, or few people, it doesn't matter. We have to have God's approval, for sure, in what we do. And that's the truth. So, many people also then find instruments in personal logic. After going around the whole circle, they'll either come back to where they start, and I, uh, they'll say things like, I just don't see any harm in it, or it just seems to me that if a person truly loves God and uses an instrument to praise Him, that God couldn't refuse that. Um... Even if we have preference, it's not about us. I think that God sees that intent in His judgment call. Consider these timeless principles that we can learn from the Old Testament. It is not in man to direct his own steps. Following his own path leads to death. So it's very scary to start out on a journey simply saying, I'm going to justify this because I just can't see anything wrong with it. Our sight's very limited. To grow, we at least need the right foundation. And these principal truths of reverence, guardrails as we approach the Word, are a good foundation to grow from. It's often said, we find what we look for, even if it's not there. So don't ask the wrong question. The brain will give an answer. Don't ask, how do I feel about it? Or or, what can we see right or wrong with it? Here's a better question. Since Scripture tells me to sing, can I find any other New Testament instruction? Of all the work that people have done to try to find justification for it, uh, who prefer it strongly enough to search for for it, um, it just reminds us that We can find it in just about every place except the one place that we need to find it to authorize it as command. The New Testament of our Lord. No one finds it in the New Testament. And thinking of 2 Timothy 3, all the New Testament scriptures equip us to do good works, and we are equipped in the New Testament to sing. And I'm I'm glad that we are. That's a beautiful thing. I've loved every song sung that we've all sang. I hope I used each version, a, a, a tense of that correctly, every verb tense. But I appreciate every song. They've edified and encouraged me very much. They have done their part to fulfill Ephesians 5. That specifies the instrument that God wants played. Where we make melody, singing to the Lord in our heart. Think of it this way. When the heart is plucked out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks when the heart is plucked our sung words become the fruit of our lips as a sacrifice of praise and that beauty that simplicity of God's wisdom and will never ceases to amaze me on your notes I reference Leviticus 10 uh, because not because that tells us how to worship in the New Testament but it does let us know We should take seriously God's instruction. I think that's a good principle. I hold concerned fear for anyone who holds no fear to disregard the Lord's decrees on anything and certainly worship within the new covenant. Um, I will happily let God sit on his judgment seat. I'm glad that's his role. It's not my role. But I pray that our lesson encourages you to embrace, to embrace a reverence for the Word so that on that day He can look at you and say, You are my child. God knows the difference between those who love and seek Him versus those that just prefer their way. He does. He does know that difference. Even as it pertains to something else clearly specified in Scripture. It's not up to us to tell God how to accept us. Lord, I didn't want to put you on in baptism like you said because I think you should just accept me for doing what I want to do the way I want to do it. 
Save me the way I think I ought to be saved. Who are we to say that? I was, Romans 7, lost. And he died for me. He provided a way and he's told me how to come to him. I'll put him on in baptism so that he can do his part rewarding my faith response to cleanse my soul of sin. That is his work. Appreciate Steve's comments in class. Salvation is God's work. And grace raises the bar to live for him and grow every day, giving him our all, growing. Grace covers all, but he sees if we're obedient to qualify our worthiness of being worth, of, of recipients of his gift. Let's make sure that we know our heart like God does on all matters as we stand and as we sing.